We are watching the attendees come in. It is seven o'clock Eastern Microsoft Standard Time, according to the number at the bottom of my computer, which we've all lived by for the last 13 or so months, Zoom time. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. We are going to get started here presently and are very grateful for you uh, to have joined us tonight. Seven oh one now. We're going to get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our online event, capturing the stories of our elders from Hollywood to our own families. The Parmenter Foundation is honored to sponsor tonight's event. Based in Wayland, Massachusetts, the Parmenter Foundation provides support for end of life and bereavement programs in Metro West Boston. We invite you to learn more about our mission and our legacy, as well as how to help bring hope to Metro West residents and their families during some of the most difficult, but also meaningful times in our lives. My name is Dave Cartoonin. I'm with the Parmenter Foundation. I like to describe myself as a recovering news anchor. It's a little weird doing this from Zoom land. Uh, for 16 years, I worked in television newsrooms up and down the East Coast uh, from Miami uh, to Channel 7 here in Boston. The recovering part of my news anchor tag comes from um, the work that I've been doing for the past five years. And that's been helping mission-driven organizations like Parmenter tell more meaningful stories than maybe the ones that I told on the five o'clock news. We certainly have some wonderful stories to share with you here tonight, including hopefully some of your own. So without further ado, I'd like to get tonight's program started and introduce our first guest. By her own right, Tiffany Wolf is someone whose story you should know. She is a 25 year Hollywood veteran in filmmaking and public relations. But with Tiffany, we have to start at the beginning and that beginning begins here in Boston and Brookline where her story will be very familiar to you. So we say welcome and good afternoon from Hollywood to <laughs> Tiffany Wolf. Thank you. Hi, Dave. Thank you so much. And I'm so thrilled to be here today. Well, it is wonderful to have you. And we've been looking forward to this to a, a long time together. So it's good to finally be having this conversation for real. Exactly. Let's, let's mm -hmm. start with this Boston story. If people don't know who you are, they certainly will figure out who you are through her, who your parents were and who they associated with. Um, before there was the term super agent, uh, like the likes of Lee Steinberg or Drew Rosenhaus or Scott Boris, there was Bob Wolf. And Bob Wolf sort of invented agenting for sports stars in Boston with a few people that the participants of tonight's conversation would certainly know. Tell us about your dad. Oh, gosh. Well, um, like you said, my dad was Bob Wolf. He was the first ever sports and entertainment attorney. Um, he never liked to call himself a sports agent until years later, they called him a super agent and that he liked. <laughs> so um, he really fell into, he was a pioneering a field of sports and entertainment law and really fell into it with his first uh, client being Earl Wilson uh, back in the late sixties. So um, for him to combine his passions of sports and uh, he was a semi-pro basketball basketball player himself um, to be able to do that as as your as your job was thrilling and he really was our whole life like a kid in the candy store um, and we grew up with some pretty special uh, incredibly uh, talented people living with us and vacationing with us and so it was kind of a, an unusual uh, upbringing and I don't think I've realized until I've gotten older how kind of unique it was we were kind of this ordinary family doing ordinary things with extraordinary people um, and we really became a family for so many of these young athletes that um, needed a father figure and a mother figure and siblings to kind of get through this heady unusual uh new life that they were embarking on. So it was really a family business in a way. Yeah, and, and we have to stop and giggle at the new kids on the block photo just oh, yeah. for a second uh, be <laughs> before I go on because it wasn't just sports later on. Um, but tell us about that. This this wasn't just a, I, this was a vocation for your father, right? I mean, he really he really found his calling, but he did bring it home to the family, didn't he? Absolutely. I mean, at always at the dinner table, there was Larry Bird or Larry King or um, one of the new kids or Doug Flutie. And again, it was just a real kind of humility, humble 
you know, we're all getting Chinese food. It was a very kind of uh, suburban, um, nice family, but then all these extraordinary people coming in and out and talking about the games they just played or the, or the concerts we just went to. And again, it was just nice that um, Larry Bird lived next door to us, which I think a lot of people from Boston know on Newton Street. If, if you were lucky enough to see Larry Bird mow his lawn, that was kind of a treat. Um, and so we, we just, we had players bunking with us and living with us and it's just what we knew. But for my dad, he, these, these athletes and, uh, uh, were, were family. They were like sons and daughters. They were call, they were confidants. Um, and so it really was family business, business and pleasure. It was a lot of intermingling of that. I know better than to not, um, forget to ask about your mother too. Mm. So tell me about your mom. Oh, well, I hope there are people on this platform tonight that knew my mom because she was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily lovely human being. Um, I think what you could say about my mom, Ann Wolf, who um, died very young as well as my father, is that she made everyone feel special. So whether you were the checkout boy at soup at the Star Market to the, the, the peanut vendor at the Fenway to Lady Di, she just gave people their moment. Um, so she actually became such a mother figure for everybody. And I feel so lucky that I got to call her my mom. Um, she was also very philanthropic and um, really set the bar for all of us how to be a good human being. So let's let's talk about their, their impact on your life is, is clear. Um, did your dad like to tell stories? Did your mom like to tell stories? Oh yeah. Where did you get I'm, this from? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Storytelling in our family and telling a good joke was like, it was like borscht belt sometime in our house, in our households. It's like, you know, when we, when you told a story in our house, it had to be good. You had to get in, you had to get out. You had to be, it had to have a beginning, middle and end and be clever and funny. So we took our stories very seriously. And my dad was like that too. I mean, he, he, he relished in a good story, a good sandwich and a good joke, I would say. So I'm cycling through now some of the pictures that we have of you. <laughs> um, tell me about your childhood, not in relation to your parents now, but through, through this lens. I mean, there was, there was almost this pressure like the Kennedys used to tell about sitting at the dinner table and, and Joe Kennedy would hold court with his nine children. If he didn't have something interesting to say, you didn't get a turn to speak at the dinner table, right? Y yours is different in the sense that, oh, you know, Donnie Wahlberg or, or Larry Bird stopped by or, or Jim Plunkett bunked with my brother for more than a year. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this house wasn't just that these were your dad's clients. It's that sometimes he was really providing them the launching pad for their careers as adults, as professionals, as, as sort of setting off. And, and there you were for every step of it. Yes. And being that I was the baby of the family, as you can see, I was kind of the kid's sister to everybody. That was just my role. And again, being that it was a family business, my brother and sister and I, um, I think they're on here tonight. Um, uh, it was, we all had such incredibly uh, unique experiences. You know, uh, Stacy would get dropped off by Jim Craig at cheerleading practice. And I would go to Larry's training at the Hellenic. And, you know, we were, we were all just like siblings to these athletes too. Um, so for me, I didn't know any different. You know, this is what I grew up with. Um, the thing that I look back now that I'm older is how grateful I am that my parents um, always kept us grounded, always kept us part of the experience. They really were part of the school of life. Um, and that uh, they, they always let us make sure always that to, to understand that we were uh, blessed and to be grateful for what we had. We never took it for granted. And leaving Larry King up here for a second, we'll get to more uh, about Larry King in a moment. And we'll actually hear from Larry King before the night gets out. Um, this, this story um, sort of launches your own career in a way that I, I think, of course, was unexpected. Uh, certainly has a seminal uh, role in not only your life, but what became your calling as well. By 1993, and you'll have to share with the ages uh, at which both of your parents passed away, um, both of your parents were gone. Well, my, my mother, uh, my father died at 65 and my mother died at 62. So as I got older, I realized I didn't have 
the role models of what it looks like to be a well-lived 70-year-old, 80-year-old, 90-year-old, 100-year-old as we're all living longer these days. And I craved my parents' uh, advice, their love, their, uh, their guidance. And so um, that's kind of how I decided to start this project was to just uh, hopefully pick up some surrogates and some friends of the older generation. It really started from my passion for really loving the older generation. I worked in a nursing home in college. I've just always had an affinity for that cohort. Well, this of course is the, is the natural union between sort of the missions of, of Silver Screen Studios and of the Parmenter Foundation. You know, here in Metro West Boston, Parmenter is, is trying to connect people uh, to services that they need, but also show how you can deliver hope in ways that maybe people don't expect or look for at this important time in their life. So before we get to the story mm -hmm. about how Silver Screen Studios was born, and, and this not just being a passion project of yours, but sort of being driven by your own experience, uh, tell us the story about your father's funeral uh. and, and, and Larry King. <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, some of, some of, folks on here might have been at that funeral. And, uh, my, you know, my father died suddenly of a heart attack. So it, it was it was sudden and it really was, um, it was at Temple Ameth in Brookline, Mass. Um, and it was so filled that they had to put speakers outside in the streets with, with people outside in the streets. It's really beautiful when I think about it. And then and then the inside of the, of the congregation was, was filled with, you know, the governor and new kids and Larry Bird and Larry King. And so it really kind of was a, a who's who for a funeral. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was very sudden, it was very sad. And then Larry King got up um, and like kind of looked around at the crowd and said, I'm Larry King. I'm the Larry they put on hold when the other Larry calls, meaning Larry Bird. And that just that just set the tone for the rest of the funeral. It became it became like comedy hour, where in fact I heard some people leaving saying, "Wow, that was the best funeral I've ever been to," <laughs> which uh, I would like to be so lucky. And how old were you at this point? I was twenty one, so and at it was Tufts. and at Tufts. That's right. Um, so it, it was it was uh, it as everyone knows with grief and loss. It was it was as if someone just switched a light and your life was suddenly different. Um, so I learned a lot over the years about how to cope with grief. And this project has really been kind of a outcome of that. So a quick question to take us between Tiffany, age 21, and a modern professional with a, a full career under her belt when she decides to launch this project uh, a few years ago. Um, who did you call on for that advice, on, on the adulting advice, as we would like to call it? Whether we know those people or not, how did you get that in the absence of your parents? Mm. Well, a lot of them were my parents' friends. So actually, Marion Ross was part of the series. She's like my godmother. Um, and she uh, she's actually, she's 93, um, though she likes to say she's 90 F and 3. So, <laughs> um, so I was lucky. My mom had incredible, my parents both had incredible friends that really kind of enveloped us kids. Uh, and, and, you know, took us in and, and so to speak. And I'm very close with Beth Havelcheck and Linda Schwartz and um, Marion. And there's just so many people that are still in my life to this day, even though my parents have been gone for so long. Um, and then I just have this way. I mean, I, I meet people at parties or at Starbucks. And my husband always says, like, can you bring someone home that's like younger than 80? <laughs> because I just make friends with people of that cohort easily. So it seemed like a perfect segue that I don't just have to be the, the lucky recipient to, to get their stories, but how can I share it with people? Well, we're gonna take a, a brief break here to watch a short clip about the birth of Silver Screen Studios. Thank you. And we set out and traveled the country to capture stories of incredible older seniors, uh, both in and out of the public eye and to really help people see what it looks like to have a great last act of your life, to be a very well-lived 85-year-old, 90-year-old, 100-year-old. It's been a real pleasure to have met so many incredible older people that um, have incredible stories and are often overlooked in society. And um, to be able to shine a light and have a platform for them to 
tell their stories. So with that, I'd like to uh, help with this story by introducing our second guest. Uh, Noam Dromi is the Managing Director of Reboot Studios, which is an arts and culture nonprofit that reimagines and reinforces Jewish thought and traditions. He's an Emmy-winning uh, producer uh, and another driving force behind the mission of Silver Screen Studios. So welcome again from Hollywood, Noam Dromi. Hey, Dave, <laughs> how are you? It's great to see you. Uh, thanks for being here with us. I want you to start, Noam, by telling us the, the mission and the idea behind Silver Screen before COVID existed and what you had set out to do. Sure. Um, by way of explaining that, let me actually take a step back and speak about the work we do at Reboot and how fortunate we were to find uh, Tiffany's project and really work with her over these last couple of years to develop it. So as you said, Reboot is a uh, a Jewish arts and culture nonprofit. Um, it's been around for 20 years and our mandate is really, uh, we think of ourselves as kind of the definitive R&D environment for the creative Jewish world. And by that, I mean that we recognize that um, the Jewish faith practice and community is very iconoclastic. It's very uh, far reaching in many respects. And we have an amazing membership, I'd say probably at this point around just under 800 strong, that are some of the greatest creative professionals, folks in academia and politics and social justice, uh, in entrepreneurship. And we really are focused on cultivating and supporting their ideas that we believe can be brought to scale that reinforce Jewish values, which really are ultimately human values. The values of what we refer to in Judaism, in Hebrew as tikkun olam, the mandate that we all have to repair the world. You know, some of the general ideas there. And what was so amazing was that when Tiffany first presented this project to our executive leadership, it was really governed around the idea of what she said, which is that uh, this is true in, in any religion and any background, uh, respecting your elders and really benefiting from their knowledge Sorry about that, hit mute accidentally. Um, and she had said that, um, as she shared a moment ago, uh, really finding the stories of older adults and how they through resiliency and wit and wisdom managed to persevere during difficult times was something she wanted to capture. So by way of that background to answer Dave, your question specifically, um, when Tiffany and I first met, and I took on the role that I currently have with Reboot, the project had already iterated through its initial cycle. It went by the name The Last Act series, and she had already begun in her home base of the Bay Area in uh, Northern California of capturing really great stories um, and sort of figuring out how to make this idea grow and be resonant. And she and I sat down and she really expressed to me the things that were important to her in terms of how we could build this, how it could scale, how it could be really transformative for organizations, for individuals, and in general, for everyone who recognizes that tomorrow is promised to no one. And we really wanna make sure we capture the stories of our older loved ones. So the first year of her and I knowing each other, we traveled around the country together. Uh, we got to tell, uh, you know, obviously LA is home base for me, but not for her. So we interviewed an amazing group of people in LA. We interviewed an amazing group of people in Detroit. You know, we have expanded into Chicago, New York, really all around the world. And then COVID hit. And what she and I recognized was, while it was no longer going to be feasible to travel and sit in a room with an older adult, because we know that disproportionately in terms of morbidities and all the other variables, it wasn't going to be safe for us to be with them. But we also recognized that they were significantly impacted by the isolation of quarantines and lockdowns and what have you. So she and I said, look, there are these commercially available platforms and tools, whether it's FaceTime or Skype or Zoom, how do we figure out how to make this work? And Dave, it really opened up the world to what we were able to accomplish because suddenly, people were willing to do this who may have been reluctant even pre-COVID to have us in their homes. 
and we got to create amazing new content and launched a series concept, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more throughout this webinar called Dispatches from Quarantine, where not only were we able to interview amazing celebrities, but we were also able to interview everyday people who are the celebrities in their own family as well. So first, let me say thank you for giving us the Zoom mm -hmm. moment of the accidental mute and that it wasn't me <laughs> that did it. Uh, the second thing, so. Tiffany, is if I could contract Gnome to do all of my introductions uh, going <laughs> forward, I would certainly appreciate that as well. Well, so, he has an exclusive, but yeah. <laughs> we, we can negotiate that. Yeah. So Tiffany, tell me before COVID, what did you learn through traveling the country that you didn't already know about what you wanted this to do? Hmm. Well, I was so fortunate that Noam kind of saw my little idea and took it to a whole other level that I never really anticipated. Um, so our, it, the, the, the content really has evolved over the years where the last act series was more kind of that journalistic style, just interview format, no archival footage, no research. Noam brought that whole piece into it, um, which really makes the whole experience more rich, more, um, exciting to work with the person to capture photos and video and things that really shape their lives. Um, I've, I, every time I go in part to be the lucky recipient across from some of our subjects, I learn something. And I always think, God, how did I get so lucky to be this person in this moment, um, experiencing this authenticity and this wisdom. So every person we have interviewed and it's, I think we're going on like almost a hundred people. I I've, I've just feel like, wow, I really found something I love to do. Well, so COVID hits here and Noam explained some of the reasoning and, and some of the really the brilliance behind it, right? Is, is that, you know, we all went and hid uh, and locked ourselves in the house, but we are, we all were more receptive to opening up in ways that we had not opened up before. Yes. And so I want to, I, 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 I want to set a precursor that, that says in Massachusetts, it, it is legal for me to tell everyone what Tommy Chong did during COVID, but I might let you guys <laughs> tell me what Tommy Chong did during COVID because he well, was we're one in of California, your first, right? so I think that's okay. <laughs> um, Noam, you can take that one. <laughs> um, you know, look, the thing that was so amazing was that the people who immediately opened up themselves up, which as um, Tiffany said, and you shared earlier, included Larry King and others who we'll speak about later. I think what was so awesome about Tommy Chong, which who was introduced to us through one of our connections in the Reboot Network, um, was that here was a guy who is legendary based on who he was as a storyteller, the life that he's led, the time that he spent in jail. Um, and you know, while all this was going on, he not only was building a cannabis business, mm -hmm. but he also was dancing the Argentinian tango with his beautiful and amazing wife every day. And he was uh, out, you know, chipping golf balls off the roof of his house in Pacific Palisades. Um, and in general, he really spoke to the fact that after he had gone through the experience of being in jail that first night, and really having that panic attack and then going into a state of mind to get through it, it was an example as so many of the other seniors with whom we spoke indicated that so much of what we deal with in our life is dictated by our frame of mind. And here was a guy who, yes, speaks on a plane that I think goes beyond one that many of us have experienced or can comprehend, but his advice was sanguine and just incredibly beautiful and powerful because here was a man who loves life and loves the earth and the medicines that the earth can provide <laughs> to us, et cetera. And if you don't know who Tommy Chong is, be careful Googling, but Chong. Tommy <laughs> Chong of course is, is the, is the half of the, you know, famous Hollywood duo Cheech and Chong mm -hmm. who are, were not only hilarious and made hilarious movies, but have uh, Tommy Chong has, has had a television career well into his, his golden years and uh, is just a remarkable spirit, uh, regardless of, of how anyone may feel about the other life choices that he's made in his life. There was another one, Tiffany, that I'm not gonna let you answer this one yet, that started with a cold call. So let's watch this. You know, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine 
wrote a book called um, God Almighty, in a novel. And in the book, uh, man dies and goes to heaven and he meets God and God says, who are you? He says, I'm man, I was made in your image. Man, he said, I don't remember you. I remember making the uh, flowers because they're pretty and little insects who can dance and jump around. I remember that. I, what do you do? And man <laughs> decides to, and this is very brilliant, he decides to do what he does. He does a soft shoe. If you want to ask man, because the pity of man is, is you know, Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly doing a soft shoe. You can't not melt when you see something like that. He does a soft shoe and God watches and he says, can you teach me that? Uh. <laughs> so Carl Reiner, I will say, Carl Reiner, I would ask it, I, I would ask him to tell me any story about anything, even you know, eating his dinner watching Jeopardy at night. I, I really wouldn't care what it was because he's just so engaging and, and has such a spirit about him. And you didn't even know Carl Reiner when you called him, Tiffany. It, it's it, it's unbelievable. We I literally, uh, you know, like Larry King, obviously there was the familial connection. But Carl Reiner was just a bucket list. I said, what the heck? You know, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, found his number on IMDb, called his management company. Strangely, someone answered the phone at the management company. This is in COVID. And uh, it somehow got, the request got to Carl Reiner. And about two weeks after we uh, put in the request, he emailed, uh, his assistant emailed that he said yes and would like to do it. And we, you know, fell off our chairs. We couldn't believe it. There is the other part that he actually demonstrated to you how he uses his electric shaver to keep looking spry and sharp all the way to the end. Yes, when oh, we first when yeah. we first got on Zoom, he uh, he was shaving with a Norelco, and I'm going to know him. Is he shaving or is this like a bit or is he is this a comedy? What do we? But it was brilliant. It was just brilliant. He didn't say anything for like ten minutes, and um, what's really nice is I have gotten I have. Uh, young boys. And uh, so I thought, well, when are they ever going to meet Carl Reiner? So I, I grabbed them. And while he's doing the bit, and I said, oh, you know, sorry to bother you, Mr. Reiner, but can I introduce you to my kids? And wow, to have that moment with Carl Reiner, and he couldn't have been more gracious. Um, that whole, and I know Noam can attest to this, but that whole interview was pure joy. Just pure. We Everybody was cracking up. I mean, he was 98. As we know, this was his last well, I'll get, you know, his last interview, but he was, he wanted, he was a showman to the end and he wanted to entertain us. So Noam, tell us about that. This, this ends up being um, Paul Reiner's last interview. Um, you know, the thing that we recognize in terms of the privilege of interviewing these incredible luminaries, these icons of media, stage and screen and other uh, professional arenas is that they may not be alive all that much longer. Uh, that's something you never necessarily want to contemplate because so many of them have been a part of the fabric of memories that each of us have throughout our own lives of things that they've done that really have inspired mm -hmm. us. You know, it's funny, I just as a quick aside, I was thinking, damn, I wish Carl Reiner would have been alive to see the Disney Plus series WandaVision <laughs> because the Dick Van Dyke show was such a seminal part of that narrative as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we sadly not too long, literally, so, so just to provide a little bit of uh, context and timeline, um, we interviewed him in, I'd say less than a month's time, we had completed the interview, uh, Tiffany and I sent it to him, and uh, not only were we blown away by the praise that we gotten back, I had found, he spoke of um, a favorite comedy record that he listened to as a kid. Um, and he misnamed who the comedian was, but because I'm a little bit of an archival, like savant, Nerd. I guess maybe <laughs> savant, I, I shouldn't call myself a savant, but an archival um, uh, hobbyist, I actually found the clip and he was just blown away by the fact that he had, uh, th that I tracked it down because he did his version of it and we kind of cut back and forth between the two. Um, we also then got word from Carl's partner, um, 
in his publishing company because he self he published his own books at that point in his life uh, that he and Mel Brooks, um, a matter of weeks before he passed, sat down with their TV trays and after watching their regular ritual, which they even did during COVID after they were safely tested, um, they watched Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, and then they watched our, our piece together, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and then he tweeted about it and said, you know, these are some of my fondest memories, learn more about me uh, by watching my dispatch from quarantine. And six days later, Tiffany and I awoke to the heartbreaking news that he had died. But what an amazing life, what a privilege to have gotten to spend some time with him and share a little bit of his story with the knowledge mm -hmm. that what we made brought him some joy as he did to so many people throughout the years. So here is another person who knows something about an interview um, that was a little bit closer to you, Tiffany. I've got a lot, I got a lot of blessings. I have been at the head table of life. I've seen uh, evil and good. Uh, I've seen bad things and nice things. I get a chance to interview so many people and world leaders. Hey, I've been doing it uh, 63 years. I'm still just as curious as always. I, that's the one thing that kept me going is curiosity. My endless search to learn more never left me. Wow. So I think that we could talk for another several hours about the light and the spirit of these stories that we've heard. But the reason I, I want to pivot here with Larry King is not only what a close relationship you had with him, Tiffany, but also that for you, this is a practical example of, of what your mission can be, even when you don't have Oscars or Emmys, um, to gather stories about your loved ones. Because for you, Larry King is a person who can tell you stories about your parents. Absolutely. And uh, one of the most blessed things about that, we were also Larry King's final interview actually, is, um, half of the time he just wanted to talk about my dad and how much he missed him and our family and memories and take a walk down memory lane. And I'm so grateful I have that footage now that I can share with my siblings. And uh, he kind of documented for us in that moment, his love and uh, for my father and their friendship. Um, so I think that, that those are the kinds of things we realize that are so important. The time is of the essence to you know, say, I love you now. Um, ask those questions now, and if you can record them. And I think that clip is also an, a, a good reminder, you know, we had gotten on Zoom during COVID. It's very unprecious time. You know, we're, we were flying the plane as we built it, so to speak, because, you know, Zoom is wonky and it's, it's not, you know, we're not going into someone's home with the whole production team, but we're like, it doesn't matter. We want to capture the stories now during quarantine. So you can see his cook in the back and making noise, but so what? And I think I would say that to everybody right now. Uh, so what? It's not doesn't have to be perfect. Um, as long as and, and the more authentic, even the better to kind of capture those little moments in life that are not, are not uh, so so uh, produced. So we're going to move into the, the the portion of the program here where we talk about not just telling stories of everyday people who have extraordinary stories to tell. Uh, some tips on how anyone can do it themselves. Um, but before we, we, we put a capstone on this part of it, Noam, I, I want to ask you, we're emerging slowly but surely and, and hopefully out of a global pandemic now. And this time that we are about to be granted, you know, is somewhat a return to normalcy. But I think there's much more of a preciousness around our time our relatives, our stories. And one only needs to look at the reunion videos that you see on social media of grandparents and their children that are taking place all over the country right now to remember that there is a lesson for this in your mission and in all of our lives to, to capture these stories, um, not just before someone's gone, but because of the impact it'll have on our relationships with them before they go. So what is your post COVID hope? Sure. Um, so I want to say a couple things and, and, uh, we'll get into the Q and a later, but I, I take note of a Q and 
a comment from Leah Abrams who spoke about the fact that you know a lot of people do this kind of work, um, personal historians, if you will. Um, and I think what really is important to recognize is that the mission statement that Tiffany and I have uh, is one that we stole from a little company called Nike, which is just do it. A, a recognition of the fact that you know tomorrow's promise to no one, and we may feel like it's not the right time, the circumstances are not ideal, but our goal is very simple. Um, there, the pandemic has made us recognize that we don't know anything about what tomorrow will bring and we hope for the best, but our families really are literally and figuratively the DNA, the fabric of who we are. And I often find when we speak to younger people, that they don't know enough about their families. You know, we live in, in such a ephemeral society with social media and streaming media where everything about is about newness and about now. And I think that, you know, what Tiffany really set out to do and that I've been so privileged to partner with her on to really continue to build and grow and evolve is the idea that we want everyone in America and around the world to make sure that they're honoring their elders by telling their stories. So that when your grandchildren's grandchildren think back about who came in their family, they're not having to try and piecemeal a family tree together or, or rely on anecdotes that are maybe through the haze of memory and vague recollections, but they've literally got it there. And Dave, the thing is, it's so easy, relatively speaking, to capture this stuff. If you have a smartphone, you can do it. If you've got a computer, you can do it. Whatever you need to do, it can be done. And we wanna make sure everyone does it. So we've set a goal for ourselves that says, by the end of 2022, we personally wanna capture 10,000 stories, but we wanna inspire 100,000 people to capture their stories too. Thanks for that. It's, it's not just a question of, of promoting one's venture as, as, as much as it is just understanding the importance of, and the impact that this can have, um, not just for generations, but for existing relationships before they're lost. Um, there is another reason that we chose this evening uh, for the event. Uh, this week, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day is later in this week. And this event isn't meant to say, capture the stories of Holocaust survivors before they're gone. But it is instructive to know that by decades end, there will be fewer than 100,000 living Holocaust survivors. And while that is in effect the hardest story to tell, uh, we thought it was poignant to host this week as a reminder, not only that these stories are being lost every day to time, but also that that can be instructive for the, this global pandemic that we are emerging from and the preciousness of life and the imperative that we all have um, to live every microsecond uh, the best that we can, but, but to foster these relationships and make these memories and capture them before they're gone. So to pivot from that, we have a, a wonderful clip from one of your, I won't say every day, uh, silver screen stars uh, because he is a poet but I think puts a, puts a good, a really fine point on this. I must survive. I must survive in the hard beast. There's little hope, boils, blood in school, bones, tender and skinny, inflammation, degradation, broken shoes too tight, famished, underweight. Will it end? Will we transcend, return, return? Oh, gracious God, and promise never again, never again. That's a little, little strong. So that was Arthur Weil, a poet, a Holocaust survivor, and somebody you met in a theater, Tiffany. Oh, yes. I mean, this is what happens. I go to places and <laughs> Arthur and I were sitting next to each other at the theater and um, out of nowhere, when the intermission came up, he just handed me his book of poems and I instantly fell in love. And um, when we started this whole project, Arthur was one of the, the first people on my mind to interview. Uh, I didn't realize at the time that he was a World War II hero and that he um, had 
had over 27 books of poems and that he went to the public schools throughout the Oakland school district and read poetry and talked about being a Holocaust survivor to the students. I didn't realize all, all of this uh, when meeting him, but, um, and Arthur right now is, is in a um, residential facility in Oakland. And that's another thing that's so heartbreaking to me, like in COVID that here are these heroes, right? And these these extraordinary people that have had extraordinary experiences that we could never really even comprehend. And they can teach us about resilience and about how to get through this challenging time right now. And, you know, there some of them are alone in a residential facility. Nobody's asking them questions. So that, that just hits home too for right now uh, during the pandemic. So Noam, what's your advice for people in this situation, not just when they have a difficult topic to discuss, um, which is, certainly important to show sensitivity and ease into. And we'll get to that part a little bit uh, after the next clip. But my question right now is the advice that you would have for anyone who knows they have someone in their life that has a story that someone should hear that is extraordinary, at least extraordinary to their family. How do you get them to just start talking? Sure. Um, I want to point out first that the thing that so many of us don't always recognize is that trauma can really be intergenerational. And there has to be a recognition that whether it's the horrors of the Holocaust, um, the original sin of chattel slavery, any range of horrific things that have been visited upon the ancestors of people and even things that happened far more recently are things that we can't assume individuals will always be incredibly communicative about. And one of the things that we recognize in the work that we are doing is you gotta ease into it. You gotta have an understanding that someone will share a story in the time frame and the manner which is most appropriate to them. Um, so again, I speak as someone who's passionate about this work, but I don't profess to have any, you know, meaningful expertise other than to say what works for Tiffany and I. And that is that we really begin by celebrating commonalities and really celebrating the idea of hope. So, you know, if a younger, so much of the work we do, Dave, is also about intergenerational oral histories, a grandchild interviewing a grandparent, you know, under our tutelage or what have you. And we're very much focused on the notion that you start with, hey, when you were my age, what was some of the favorite music you listened to? Or who were the kinds of stars of, you know, stage and screen or what have you, who you idolized in a way? And then understand that through a sharing of similar experiences, you can then test the waters to dovetail into things that can perhaps be a little bit more sensitive. Um, I realize that's sort of a very broad answer to your question, but I think that what is important is particularly in our experience, often older adults, as Tiffany said a moment ago, no one asks them anything. But when you do ask them, you wanna realize that you're having a conversation and that you have to recognize that they're going to share on their terms, not on your terms. And just be very empathetic and aware of what that is. And our experience has been that once you demonstrate that level of care and consideration, People share a lot more than maybe they even intended to do at first, but the respect is absolutely critical. And we have another wonderful example of that from another Holocaust survivor. Develop the attitude I have, which teaches me to, and to accept whatever happens and to look for blessings. In other words, my attitude is always positive. I was forced to do that by, by things that were happening to me. And I wasn't going to go under, I was going to go on living and find the sunny side of life. And at my 100th birthday party, which was a very big party, there were 135 people in a big hall. And I got up and sang one song. Enjoy yourselves. You're younger than you think. Enjoy yourselves while you're still in the pink. 
the years go by as quickly as a wink. Enjoy yourselves, enjoy yourselves. You're younger than you think. <sighs> well, you certainly can't uh, put a price or a, or, or, or a value on, on sharing an experience like that with really anyone, no less a loved one in your life, uh, whether you know the story from them or not. Tiffany, talk about maybe in the specific case there of Riesel Eichelfeld or anyone that you've interviewed, how going through this process kind of helps foster those relationships between family members or their friends and strengthens their bond before we start talking about their legacy, before they're gone? Hmm. Well, I, I, you know, that's the one thing I love about um, interviewing older loved ones is it's, it can be a family affair, you know, it can really be an intergenerational um, experience. And nowadays, as we know, our teenagers and uh, young adults are probably better editors than we are to, to put something together. But um, I, you know, what I've learned throughout this process, now Risa is an example of that, I think when I spoke in the beginning of feeling like I was in the presence of something incredible and extraordinary. Um, that was really my moment with Risa, to be with someone who'd been through so much hardship and so many challenges, things that we never could have imagined. And yet she chose to find the sunny side of life every day. Um, her refrigerator had post-its of positive affirmations. She does calisthenics every week. She's, she's an inspiration. I mean, absolute inspiration. Um, so those are the, the kinds of things I take with me of, and, and, and the, the finished product is the film, but the experience of filming is so precious too. So again, even if it's not perfect, the outcome, just the inter, the dialogue and having that moment is so important for everybody um, of the experience. So and, that's and, just as important. And Dave, just quickly to really kind of uh, reinforce the point that Tiffany made. Um, look, we're, this is not altruistic, like we're selfish. This is mm -hmm. as yeah. much of a joy and a privilege for us as anything, which is why we so enjoy the work. Also just a, a funny aside with Risa in terms of you know her resiliency and her just good naturedness. You know, the, the song that she sang in that clip is her version of the Guy Lombardo song, Enjoy Yourself, It's Later Than You Think, so, which kind of has a somewhat negative, if you will, connotation. And she's made it better. The woman who's now 104 uh, literally said, you're younger than you think, because pretty much everybody mm -hmm. else is. So just such an incredible woman and such a, a, a an icon in Los Angeles since um, she escaped Nazi-occupied Austria when she was in her early 20s and then went to the UK for a while and then finally made her way to Los Angeles in the 1950s and has educated scores and scores, generations of young people, many of whom are now in their 50s, 60s, 70s and showed up for her 100th birthday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it yeah. shows you how lucky we are to interview these incredible people. And, and that's just in LA. I know that there's equal measure, you know, an, an equal number of them throughout the New England area and in Boston and greater Massachusetts specifically. So our hour is going fast. I wanna preview how we're gonna spend the rest of our time. Uh, every story is extraordinary, particularly when it is your family's story. So we're going to get into some tips on the best questions to ask and how to draw out your own stories. We have a wonderful example uh, in the form of maybe a little Hollywood cliffhanger to show you how mm -hmm. even this, even the simplest but still well-lived life can, can have these twists and turns. Uh, we're gonna, before the hour gets out, I'll have information for you on the contest where you can enter to win uh, a silver screen production uh, pr produced remotely uh, of, of a family member or a loved one of yours. And then we will save time at the end for Q and A. Uh, we might hang around a little bit later if people Absolutely. stay on to ask their questions as well. Uh, but we will get all of that in and I will start the how-to with this wonderful uh, proposal uh, from Dorothy Sachs. Our first date was June 19th, I remember that. Then July 20th, my father was being fated by the community for his 50th birthday and I had already asked another boy I was dating at the time from Toledo if he would like to come for that weekend. I decided 
that I would ask George instead. And our only communication had been, I don't think we'd even seen each other, was either by telephone or letter because he was 500 miles away or so. So he came and a night or two later, we sat in my folks' living room and he proposed. And I'd only seen him, I mean, I could count on one hand and, and have something, you know, fingers left over how many times we'd have to spend together. So of course I refused. Of course, I refused, of course. Uh, Tiffany, I have a hard enough time explaining to my kids mm -hmm. how in the 90s, we had to wait for the house phone to ring or the dorm phone to ring to make plans, mm -hmm. either with a crush or with a friend, right? I don't know if I could ever wrap my head around telling my kids a story about how a pen pal who I met for the first time in person proposed marriage to me. Um, but there is Dorothy Sachs saying no but here's the Hollywood cliffhanger, the story <laughs> ends well, right? She said yes. <laughs> Dorothy Sachs is one of the most beloved women in the Bay Area. Um, we had the good fortune of working with David Sachs, her grandson, who hired us to make this, this film about her grand, his grandmother for her 95th birthday. So for their Zoom celebration, they... Um, they showed this film and it's really an example of, we worked very closely with the Sachs family um, uh, calling over pictures and stories and uh, archival footage and really wanted to give, Dor you know, Dorothy's a great philanthropist and artist, their whole, their whole family just does beautiful work and philanthropy here in the Bay Area and, and beyond. Um, but we wanted to give them their due as if you were watching, you know, an A&E film about Elizabeth Taylor. And, it, you know, and because everyone's life, like Dorothy's, like what you just saw, has a Hollywood kind of cliffhanger show stopping moments. That's what, and I actually enjoy interviewing people that aren't, quote, famous in the public eye as much because their stories sometimes are more rich because they're not panned or scripted. And uh, it's just amazing that everybody does have a great story to tell. And so, well, sure did Dorothy. We love Dorothy. And as I always like in the to audience say to my with David, so hi. Guys. Oh, okay. Oh. Hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always like to say to my kids during my television career, no, I am not famous, but I am famous among my friends. Yes. <laughs> and we all are. And no, the other thing that adds richness to this, and I think the other important tip that people can get from this is, yes, we all have the tools now. I mean, the quality of the video on my iPhone is better than the $5,000 rig that I use to produce corporate videos sometime. However, there are, they're starting slow, as we talked about. There's involving multi-generations to ask age-relevant questions to get people talking. But there's also the richness that's added, and my journalism career would tell us this, and your savant would tell us this, mm -hmm. um, the archives and the records and the public records and Google can add a richness to this that not only informs the questions that you then ask and the stories that you draw out, but is infinite in preparation and glorious in production at the end. Um, so we are gonna probably go over the hour, but I'll make it quick. Um, during Passover this past year, we were around you know, a very small table. Last year was all Zoom. This year was my brother, my wife, and my mother. And we were talking about the work of Silver Screen and my brother pointed out and he said, you know, have you looked at the archives on the equivalent of Israel's sort of Library of Congress, the national records? Um, and I, I hadn't. So he said, you know, before the creation of the state of Israel, it was, uh, you know, mandatory Palestine. So they've got the archives of what, at, before the Jerusalem Post was the Palestine Post. And archives going back to the 17, early 1800s um, with amazing content in English and Hebrew and Yiddish and Ladino and Esperanto, et cetera. My, my point, which I'll get to quickly, is so many resources are available to us online. Um, in the States, you can go to the Library of Congress. Um, you know, even the city of Boston maintains an incredible archive where I found some amazing stuff about the Wolf family too. Um, and then there are resources where you can pay a small subscription fee 
newspapers.com, newspaperarchives.com and the like. What I enjoy immensely is because I was the kid who, when we used to do this kind of thing, would literally go to the Los Angeles County Library and spend hours on the microfiche films, uh, I'm sorry, microfiche machines, just going through all that because there's something about history coming alive in a way. Um, and a fun thing I like to do when we, Tiffany and I meet a new person, as I'm busy researching in the background as we did with you the other day, and I'll throw mm -hmm. out some random fact about themselves or their family from years before. And they're like, wait, how, how'd you know that? How'd you find that out? But to me, that's a joy because there's, there's a, a, a sleuthing like component. There's just something fun about realizing that even if you're not famous, there's likely some archive of your family's existence. And just like Tiffany had an amazing dad, I did as well. I'll tell a super quick story. My father born in 1931 in mandatory Palestine had a very fascinating life, was very much a Renaissance man, but ran the classical music department of Israel radio uh, during the 1960s. Part of his purview was that if uh, artists came from overseas to the States, he chaired the committee that determined whether or not they could come into Israel. Um, 1964, his committee was presented with two artists that they had to evaluate their worthiness to come into the States. One of them was an up and coming British band called the Beatles. Um, I've posted this on my social media um, because I have a copy of the memo that they released, which deemed that this band did not have artistic merit and that they were likely to cause mass hysteria among teenagers, so they were denied entry into the United States, and that was done at the behest of the committee chairman, my father, um, <laughs> which is both hysterical and I jokingly like to say my father was doing cancel culture before that was even up. <laughs> so there you go. Tiffany, I want to wrap this segment up as, as, as I think uh, some of the best advice some of the best advice from Noam's answer right there is that if you don't have the chops on Google or archives or public records or anything like that, I Call guarantee us. you there is someone in your family who does, right? Mm -hmm. There is a genealogy buff in every family and identifying yes. who that person is, is a great you know, producer credit for your homemade silver screen production, right? For your own homemade legacy project for your loved one. The last question I had for you, Tiffany, and, and I hope that this is instructive to everyone who's watching too, is if you had had the chance to do your silver screen production for your parents, what would you have asked them? Oh, wow. Um, that's a really beautiful question that no one's ever asked me, actually. Um, I think I would ask them, I, I love to, to ask a lot of the subjects and I'd like to ask my parents, kind of summing up their life of what 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 were you grateful for and what would you like to leave behind what what's your legacy um i mean if i could ask them you know if i could see them now i would ask them a whole bunch of other questions too um but really kind of a summation of what they were what they feel their blessings were in this lifetime well tiffany wolf and noam dromi I hope I can speak on behalf of both of your parents that you are living their legacy. Mm, thank, thank you so you. much for sharing these stories with us. Uh, don't, don't everyone leave yet because we're going to get to Q&A here. But first, before the hour is up, I want to make sure we meet our obligation to tell everyone about the contest that we're running, sponsored by the Parmenter Foundation. Uh, as part of tonight's program, the Parmenter Foundation is delighted to offer any of our participants tonight the chance to have uh, their own silver screen production featuring an elder loved one's life. Uh, after tonight's event is over, after we get to some Q&A, please hang around for that. Uh, you'll find all of this contest information on the Parmenter website. Uh, that's parmenterfoundation.org slash contest. To enter, all you need to do, you don't have to be on here tonight. If you're watching the archival version of this somewhere in Cyberland later, you can also follow through and sign up for the contest. All you need to do is create and submit a short video through our special platform or by email to the Parmenter Foundation describing why your loved one should have the starring role in the production or submit a video of that loved one telling a story about his or her past. The entry deadline for the contest is Friday, May 7th. So you've got a good month. The winner will be notified after a judging period. The winner will be notified May 28th. Silver Screen Studios will remotely produce one of their signature film productions for your elder loved one's life 
And again, you can find all of the contest rules, terms and conditions, fine print, radio voice speaking very fast, uh, available at the conclusion of this event, mm -hmm. farmentorfoundation.org slash contest. So without further ado, at 7.59, we're gonna hang around a little bit. We've still got 99 people on. We've got some great questions. So as long as the conversation is good and, and we can whip through some of them, I'd like to. Uh, for either of you, uh, we had a question about how long each interview is that you guys typically do, uh, or just as a general advice for someone trying to produce their own, how long should these interviews generally go? Um, I'm happy to take that. So sure. uh, it's sort of a two-part answer by way of uh, explaining the following, which is Tiffany and I will often speak to our subjects for one hour, two hours, two and a half hours. But we're mindful of the fact that our job as storytellers, trying to put a little bit of Hollywood pixie dust onto these productions, is that that's, that's a big ask for a viewer. So part of the work we do, and Dave, this ties back to the archival sort of elements of what we spoke on earlier, is how do we really produce a salient, I'd say eight to 15 minutes. Um, and that will vary based on need. Um, you know, the piece we did with Dorothy Sachs uh, and her family was probably a little bit on the longer side. Um, but then for Larry King and Carl Reiner and others, I'd say eight, nine, 10, 11 minutes. Um, you know, what you have to recognize is that the very polished and produced piece um, is going to be better if it's shorter. It really is going to challenge you as someone who is responsible for helping tell the story of that loved one to really tell parts that will resonate for people who watch it after the fact. Um, but it's also just great to have all of it so you can go back and refer to it later. We looked, uh, we cut the piece for Larry King, but then there's a whole separate piece that Tiffany and her family have, which is just a 10 minute conversation talking about her dad as well. And that's so amazing to have in one interview. Tiffany, how about this one for you? Interviewing more than one elder at a time, such as a husband of wife. I have my own views on this as a journalist. It's yeah. a cameraman's nightmare, um, <laughs> unless maybe it were Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, and then I think I'd take them right. both at the same time. Advice on interviewing more than one person at a time. Well, I, I actually love that. Our first series, The Last Act, we did um, a segment on uh, couples. So it was a very kind of when Harry met Sally kind of format. We used two cameras. Um, and there's something so rich and wonderful about that because what's happening between the two of them is really in real time and you're capturing that. Um, so I think it's wonderful to do. I know it's harder, you know, production wise, but uh, I love interviewing couples because I think um, even what they don't say comes through. <laughs> and it, it's just, uh, just to have that little time capsule is really beautiful. So the good answer to that is with a question, how many cameras do you have? And then just <laughs> right, one at right. each subject and then you get it all no matter what. Um, here's a great question that I've got my own response to. What are good questions to ask that guarantee good responses? And mine is, why did you do it? and just leave it there. Wow, I you love never that. know what they're going to say. Um, but Noam, how about, how about the go-to questions that you always like to keep in your back pocket, whether you want to get someone started talking or if you're having trouble getting them um, to start sussing out some of the stories for you? It, it's an awesome question. Um, you know, look, as I said, in some respects, the, the approach that I try to take as an interviewer and prior to doing this, you know, I, I worked in um, marketing in the entertainment industry for a long time, so did a lot of behind the scenes and EPKs and things like that, which is you always are well served to find that common ground, to be disarming, to sort of engage with them in terms of your commonalities with the person you're sitting across from. And then my go-to question, because it always elicits a wild response is, what's the craziest thing that's ever happened to you? Um, you know, we had a story, uh, Lawrence Kubik, who's an amazing veteran producer and agent in Los Angeles was the first agent for Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, he told us the story of the first time he produced a movie that ended up starring the Grateful Dead. And he went to go to a concert of theirs to try and get them on board. And he said uh, he was given something that he took 
and it ended up being LSD. And the next thing he knew, he woke up in a hotel room, sleeping next to their agent with no idea how he got there, <laughs> but with a commitment from them to do the film. <laughs> and those are the stories that you get when you ask about the craziest thing you've ever done, right? Indeed. Tiffany, we have a, a wonderful question that I'm gonna read verbatim here sure. uh, from Carol and Finney. Uh, it says, my mom is 94, a Holocaust survivor, and we've tried and tried to get her story. However, it's been difficult. Her memory, her English, a bit of forgetfulness. I tried with my kids to sit her around the table to ask some questions. However, she tends to go off on tangents that can go up to 30 minutes. Sometimes we don't understand at the end of speaking to her what she was trying to say. Mm. Um, I think that before I, I prompt you for your answer on this, uh, one thing that I wanna reinforce through this that Noam and Tiffany, I know you guys have been saying, is the end product is magical, but the experience and the process is just as magical. And so perhaps in this situation, maybe you don't get or distill or get that perfect story, but the 30 minutes that you got along the way is invaluable time. What else would you add to that? Mm, that's beautiful. I think um, exactly what you just said that um, it's, it's, I guess just having patience with that and maybe asking questions that aren't so, uh, you know, what we talked about earlier that are a little bit more about, you know, what, what was your favorite holiday ritual of the, what you like to eat growing up? Something that would maybe spark a memory that isn't necessarily a traumatic memory or something that's so potent, but just something like a soft touch. But again, um, even the fact that you're doing this and that you have your children doing it, the experience itself, maybe just always have, you know, I interviewed my parents. This is when I was like seven years old for Hebrew school. And I, I took my tape recorder and, you know, or the cassette tape and just even hearing them talking and, you know, the, the, the dinner table conversation and kind of the clanking of the fork and knife. I mean, they weren't even saying anything that profound, but God, do I treasure that cassette tape. So even if you're not getting the story, you're getting a lot. Um, and Dave, if I may just quickly add on to that, um, you know, I think a lot and I'm, I'm scanning some of these amazing questions that are coming up now as well. Uh, and, and I can't speak for, Stip, for Tiffany, but we'll stay as long as you're willing to stay. Um, you know, I think a lot of this is also about intention, which is, you know, I often have said, don't allow perfect to be the enemy of doing a thing. Um, and in terms of a process or an agenda, we're just gonna let the interviewee say what they need to say. Um, and whether it is directly tied to the question we have or they're going a little free flowing, they're so often just happy to have someone ask questions and care. And we're really just focused on that, the process almost being more important than the outcome in some respects. Um, and then you recognize, yes, there are language barriers. Yes, there are issues as people get older with Alzheimer's or dementia or other things. I'm, the thing I wanna to stress to people is just having empathy and patience because sometimes there's a gem in what you found that you didn't even realize. And look, in some instances, you're gonna be speaking to a person who through the just process of age and everything else, may not be the best arbiter, the best uh, um, person to tell their own story in its entirety. Those are instances where, we're, where we rely on those archives, where we rely on family members. And we've even done silver screen stories of people who are no longer alive. And we do that by approaching it with the same care and empathy. One that quickly comes to mind is the amazing story of union labor organizer, Myra Wolfgang, who was from Detroit and a seminal figure in the organized labor movement, who actually went up against Hugh Hefner to um, demand that women at the Playboy clubs around the country could be a part of a union. She died in the 70s, but I feel like we did her story justice because her two daughters really sort of told her story and allowed us to help shape that in a way. Well, being mindful of the time and watching our participant load uh, slowly trickle down, I, I want to make sure that we get the shameless plug and ask the key Q&A question, how does someone engage you if they want to uh, have a silver screen, you know, uh, production of, of their loved one's life? 
Let me start with uh, the fact that we, I recognize we may not get to all these questions. So our website is silverscreenstudios.org, silverscreenstudios, plural, dot org. There's a contact us section there and anyone whose question we missed, reach out to us there. And of course, that's also where you can reach out to us about how we might work together. Not only if you're an individual who has a family member and you'd like us to work together with you to capture the story, or just help you figure out how to do it on your own, but also if you're an organization and would like to um, partner with us so that we can develop um, programs and curricula and ways to make this experience something that you can do as part of your school or your community center or your organization, because that's an incredibly important part of what we wanna be able to help with as well. And as we said before, Plenty of other organizations and individuals do this amazing work. We're privileged to be among this field that I never heard of before today of personal historians. Um, and whomever you find, just realize that you wanna partner with somebody who cares as much about telling the story of your family authentically as anyone else. Of course, please hire us because we love what we do and we wanna do it for you and your family and your organization too. If, if, if I, Tiffany Wolf, any final thoughts? Yeah. Well, yeah, if I can just mention my dream being that I'm from Boston, I grew up in Boston, uh, Boston's home to me. Um, we have been traveling the country um, doing uh, wonderful partnerships with residential homes and um, JCCs and then being hired by families to do to do personal films in different parts of the country. But Boston, this is kind of my dream is to come to Boston um, and to be able to capture the stories of my uh, community and of the other loved ones of the Boston area and people I know or my friends, parents or grandparents. Um, so my dream would be to bring a lot of our work to Boston and would be thrilled for that. Well, I, I can't thank both of you enough. Um, this does conclude our event for the evening. Being mindful of the time, I will say in the past year, I have been on many 20 minute Zoom calls that went way too long. This has been a 71 minute Zoom call that I wish could go mm -hmm. another three hours. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank everybody who took the time to join us tonight. Uh, of course, special thanks to Tiffany Wolf and Noam Dromi for sharing their stories, the <laughs> stories that they're trying to share with the world. A reminder that you can learn more about Silver Screen Studios at silverscreenstudios.org. Use the contact us form if you had a question that we didn't get to tonight. Uh, for everyone at the Parmenter Foundation, we hope that you enjoyed our conversation tonight, this evening. We hope that you'll look to the Parmenter Foundation in Metro West and beyond for hope and healing during end of any end of life uh, or bereavement issue. And if you have additional questions for us, you can use the contact section of parmenterfoundation.org and of course, learn more about our mission, serving the communities of Metro West Boston and beyond. So with and, that- and Dave, real quickly- tell me One last word. Oh, I apologize. Uh, all I was going to say is um, just the deepest thanks to you for such a pleasure and, and a, a really lovely conversation. I'm so glad that we've gotten the opportunity to meet you. I hope we get to work together again. And also thanks to um, Jennifer and Amanda at Parmenter as well, who really helped make tonight such a really lovely experience. We're so thankful and, for and the consideration. Course, and of course, Angela as well. Yeah, this has been such a treat on so many levels. And I'm just thrilled to have had this opportunity. So thank you. Well, thank you to you both. And mm -hmm. for the 70, 70 participants or so wow. still on, you never <laughs> need to ask me now why I left the news business because this is so much better. Uh. <laughs> thank you both. Uh, I hope everyone here has a wonderful evening and I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you so much. Bye guys. Bye-bye.